Hey, hey everyone, back again. Now we're going to continue on our political economy train after having covered Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, David Ricardo's for uh, Principles for Political Economy and Taxation, and then Capital Volume 1, Capital Volume 2, and now Capital Volume 3. So we've really moved on, moved our way through the whole domain of political economy. Now, how I'm going to approach this text, and I know that this is sacrilegious for anybody actually like in my position, interested in reaching a broad audience. But this is going to be 10 parts. Uh, and I want to apologize off the bat for that. But there's really no way around it. And so because that's just going to do wonders for me, for the algorithm, I'm being sarcastic, of course. If you can like this, if you're listening to this in podcast form and you can leave five stars, perhaps that can help compensate for just the general way uh, the algorithm is going to punish me for releasing a 10-part thing on a single book. Now, with that being said, I think the whole text is necessary. You really have to listen to it from start to finish because there are so many novel insights that he gives us toward the end that it would be silly just to listen to the first part. But, you know, listen at your own leisure, take your time. Whenever the episodes come out, download them whenever. And yeah, just just have fun with it. Now, before jumping into the, to it... Hi, for anyone new here, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, you can subscribe and see however many hundreds of videos I already have up. You'll see videos I release every single week. You're going to want to be subscribed so you can see these episodes come out every single week. If you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guigno. There are links for these things in the description that you can go and click on. If you want to help me out, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, who knows, they might get a kick out of this. Uh, or I've heard it helps people fall asleep. So if you want to help any of your friends who need <laughs> need help falling asleep, then you can re recommend this podcast. If uh, you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, we have so much to get through here. We really got to jump into it. But even before jumping into it, I want to lay out how I'm going to approach it. That is each part that each episode is going to cover. Now, I'm only going to mention this in this first episode and going forward, you'll be able to find it in the description of the episode, the breakdown of each part, all the chapters that each part covers. Now, I want to do this so, you know, in case anyone in the future just wants to hear about a certain part, they can easily find it and then just listen to that part. Now, this episode, episode one, is going to cover Engels' preface all the way up to part two, titled The Transformation of Profit into Average Profit. So this part, this episode, will cover the preface plus part one. The second episode is going to cover part two all the way up to part three, so just the entirety of part two, titled The Law of the Tendential Fall in the Rate of Profit. Then episode three is going to cover all the way up to part five, so it's going to cover both parts four and part uh, and part three, all the way up to part five, titled The Division of Profit into Interest and Profit of Enterprise. And then part four, or episode four, I should say, is going to cover up to chapter 27 of part five. And then the next episode, episode five, is going to cover up to chapter 32 of part five. And then episode six is going to cover up to the end of part five, uh, up to the beginning of part six, titled The Transformation of Surplus Profit into Ground Rent. So just to make that really clear, episodes four, five, and six are exclusively going to cover part five. And then episode seven will resume on part six, or from part six, titled The Transformation of Surplus Profit into Ground Rent, and that will cover up to chapter 41, at which point episode eight will take over and cover up to chapter 46, titled The Rent of Buildings, Rent of Mines, Price of Land. And then episode 9 will begin to cover up to chapter 49, titled On the Analysis of the Production Process. And then episode 10 will make, take us all the way to the conclusion, plus Engels' supplementary remarks at the end of the book. And this covers about 1,050 pages. So there was a lot to go through here. Now, I just wanted to also mention that I had the impression before reading this book that it wasn't really a book, that it was just an amalgamation of Marx's notes, essentially, and nothing really uh, unifying about it. And that couldn't be further from the truth. 
if you actually read this text, you wouldn't know that it was actually, you know, done after Marx had died and that it um, is not an actually like completed thing until you arrive at the end and it just ends quite, quite abruptly. So I want you to really know that because I really want to encourage you to go and read this and to know that there's a lot in here that I'm going to present, but a lot that is going to get lost here just by virtue of the fact that I'm not going to be telling it in as much detail and, and as much of a kind of linear, uh, clear way as Marx does. So just know that this is very much a book with a unifying thread running through it. Now, that puts us here into the preface by Engels, in which he says that he was, well, he was the one that put this book together, and he makes it very clear that he didn't want to do anything to change the text itself. Now, with that being said, there are a few points in which he clarifies something that Marx says, which is only really a handful of times, or he comments on an error in Marx's math and provides a correction for that. Beyond that, there's I think there's maybe one or two instances where Engels supplies like a few pages of content to say or to elaborate on a point, but really otherwise, it's all Marx, and Engels did very little here to insert himself. He really took it upon himself to maintain and retain Marx's vision for this project. So in the preface as well, Engels muses, he thinks about the way in which or one of the absurdities of capitalism is that all commodities are sold for above their value. And the reason for that is that otherwise the capitalists would not make profit. They wouldn't make money that they could then transform back into capital to grow their enterprise. Now this applies to all commodities unless we are referring to labor. Because labor for Marx is a commodity that the worker sells, but that is sold beneath its value so that the worker can be exploited. And the reason that this happens is that the capitalist doesn't want to pay the full price to the worker for the actual value of their labor, because then otherwise they wouldn't make a full profit. So to make this super simple, imagine you're working at McDonald's and you sell a McNugget. You're working there and you, you make a McNugget, make a McNugget, you cook or bake or whatever a McNugget, and it sells for a dollar, let's just say you're going to be paid 70 cents instead of a dollar. Because if you were paid a dollar, the capitalist, the owner, wouldn't make money. They would only break even. So your labor has created a dollar's worth of value in the McNugget. But you're only getting paid 70 cents. Now what this means is that the value of that McNugget is higher. Its sale price is higher than the value that has gone into, or then has been compensated for in your labor, which is just an absurd thing when you think about it in those terms, when you think about the entire economy being founded upon the premise that people are going to be undersold for their labor. Now, at this point, still in the preface, Engels thinks about some problems that exist at the core of what he and Marx calls the ideas of the vulgar economists, the political economists, and these include Adam Smith, David Ricardo, uh, some guy named Say, Malthus, um, included Proudhon, other people who tried to think about the way that money works, how the economy works, and how capital works. So some of the issues that Engels raises, or some questions that he raises, include the mystery of what average profit is, or where does it come from? How is an average rate of profit actually set? And this is going to get explained very much later in the text, so in part like six or seven that I'm going to do here. But in any case, the question that he's asking here is how do capitalists agree upon a certain degree of excess that they are going to take out of labor? So let's return to the chicken McNugget example. How, do, how does a capitalist say to themselves, I'm going to pay this worker 70 cents so that I can take 30 cents above their labor. How do they decide this 30% or you know, 30 over 70, 30 over the full dollar, this amount of profit? Where does this come from? And it must correspond to a general degree of profit taking because otherwise the capitalist couldn't be competitive. 
so there must be some degree of equilibrium across the board about what profit rate will be. So Engels, that's what he's asking here. How do we actually, how does this get established? So another thing he asks, uh, or muses about that, is he asks if it's determined by uh, the surplus value that's extracted from labor, or is it proportionate to the amount of capital forwarded in production to produce commodities, the amount of money that's put back into industry in order to make more money? He also asks, or he asks it in this way, he says, how does there take place the transformation of surplus value into profit? How does that excess above what people are actually paid for in labor in terms of surplus value, how does that get turned into profit? Now, he doesn't answer these questions here, but he uses them to set the stage for what Marx will really be focusing on throughout the course of this book. And that puts us here into part one titled The Transformation of Surplus Value into Profit and of the Rate of Surplus Value into the Rate of Profit. And this also comes with Chapter 1, titled Cost Price and Profit. So Volume 1 of Capital, for those that haven't listened to it, but I really recommend you go and listen to the episodes I've done on it, Volume 1 of Capital looked at capitalist production. Volume 2 of Capital looked at the role of circulation and exchange uh, at the time. And Volume 3 looks at what grows, in Marx's words, out of the process of capital's movement considered as a whole. And these three texts really go together. You cannot, and I cannot stress this enough, you cannot understand what Marx is getting at in Capital Volume 1 unless you've read Volume 2 and Volume 3. So all this stuff about commodity fetishism, about exploitation, about uh, you know poor working conditions, that's all great stuff. It's good to know. But until you've read all of it, that is Capital Volume 2 and Volume 3, and I would like to say Volume 2 you could probably skip. It's pretty boring, pretty dry. You really get the spark notes from that. But Volume 3 is, like, is in my mind, the pinnacle, and you really can't do without it. So here in Volume 3, where he's considering capitalism as a whole, he's going to consider in more detail competition and the everyday consciousness of the agents of production themselves. Now, this really becomes true toward the end of the text, but there are so many other important elements to this text that he doesn't present in the, inter in the first chapter here. One of them being, he's going to spend a lot of time poking holes in David Ricardo's conception of rent and how David Ricardo conceives of rent. Now, when we get there, I'm going to explain everything you need to know from Ricardo. Until then, you can go and listen to the episodes on that. But it's just important that you know that, you know, there are other things we're going to talk about here, including as well what might be the most important element of this whole book, how the profit rate over the course of capitalist production tends to fall, which might seem like a total uh, contradiction. It might seem totally moronic, but it will make sense. So he gives us a sort of recap here of the central ideas from volume one uh, and a little bit from volume two. So you have the value of a commodity, and this value is just its sale price. So if I have a McNugget and I'm selling it for a dollar, its value is a dollar in that moment. Now, the way that that dollar is decided upon, that is how the capitalist decides it's going to cost a dollar, is by adding up the amount spent on raw materials, on machinery, on buildings, on transport, plus the cost of labor, so the, you know, me making the, the McNugget, plus a little extra on top of that that they're going to want to sell, uh, sell it for in order to earn profit on top of these other costs. So the formula, just to, you know, jog your memories because I'm sure you're all familiar with this, the formula is the commodity value is equal to the price of constant capital pl plus the price of variable capital plus the price of surplus value on top of that variable capital. So what is embedded here in this formula is the idea that value as something that is added in a commodity emerges from the labor that goes into it. So if I were to start a business 
And of course, there are going to be other people trying to start businesses. I am going to need to buy machinery and raw materials in order to make things that I can sell. I cannot sell those things that I make above what it's going to cost me to be competitive with people around me, other people competing. And of course, in a globalized world, you're going to be competing with different people in different nations uh, and so on. Now, because knowledge is want to spread, that is, people are going to know various techniques and the right machinery to use and the right, you know, the right uh, materials to use, I'm only going to be able to sell the product at the price that I'm going to figure out in advance, determined by the constant capital, that is the machinery and fixed, uh, and sorry, raw materials that go into it. And I'm not going to be able to sell above those prices. And the reason for that is that if I did, I would cease to be competitive among other people because they would just undercut me. So the idea is that raw materials and constant capital in the form of machinery, buildings, etc., only add their value to the thing being made in short, uh, in, in a kind of long-winded form. So if I'm making McNuggets, I'm going to buy a grill. And let's say this grill costs me $1,000. I'm going to say, okay, I need to sell McNuggets at such a price so that for the duration of the life of this grill, I am going to be able to earn that money back of what I paid for on that grill. So you need there to be an equilibrium between that cost of that grill and what you are going to be able to make with that grill and what you're going to have to charge for in order to cover that cost. Now, if you go higher, let's say you just randomly raise your price of each McNugget to $2, then Burger King is going to be able to come in and say, hey, you know, we paid for the same $1,000 grill. We don't need to cover our costs that quickly by just doubling our price and covering that cost of that grill. Let's just keep it at the same rate so that we can undercut McDonald's. Now, the idea here is that constant capital in the form of raw materials or machinery does not add value to things. Where value comes from is from the excess value that can be taken from workers. So while you can't make a machine work harder for you or to give more than it is designed to give, uh, at least competitively, like, for example, let's say uh, you were uh, alone one night with your grill and you somehow found a way to make it more productive or you made it bigger that you could grill more and it could make you more money. While that might result in an immediate spike in profit, it will most likely soon happen that other people are going to catch wind of this and then you will cease to be competitive. And so therefore it will reach equilibrium once more. So you are not going to be able to really add value to things through the machines, through the raw materials you use. So it must come from labor. Real human labor is what adds value to things. And this is because you can make humans work harder and more efficiently in order to take more from them than you are giving in return. You can't, in other words, exploit a machine. You can only exploit humans. And this is not just Marx. This isn't just Marxist um, Marxist crap. You get this all throughout Adam Smith and all throughout David Ricardo as well. And in fact, they went so far as to be incredibly concerned about automation because automation signaled an end to the allocation of human labor in the production of commodities, which would mean an end of the possibility of creating value. So it's very important to acknowledge this part of the equation here. Now, at this point, Marx proposes that we actually crunch this formula. So commodity price is equal to uh, the price of materials in the form of C plus amount spent on wages as variable capital plus S, that which is spent or kind of extracted from labor. He says we can shorten this to clump the amount spent on machines and the amount spent on wages as cost price plus S, and he calls this cost price K. So now the formula looks like C equals K cost price plus S surplus value taken above 
what is paid for in wages. And the cost price refers to what it costs the capitalists to make that object, to make that commodity. Now, this is certainly the way that capitalists look at their own industry and the way that vulgar economists imagine the economy working, where they just take cost price, that is both constant capital in the form of what you pay on machines and, and everything else like that, plus what you pay on wages, as all being the same thing as just being one lump sum that the capitalist needs to pay, and then at the end of the day, they just earn some magic extra on top of that in, the term, in terms of surplus value. So they effectively homogenize uh, constant capital with variable capital, and in so doing, it hides the fact that all um, value really derives from only one part of cost price, and that is the real human labor, the living labor that exists in that industry. Now there is a unique opportunity here to understand the difference between profit and between value, value that is added on top of what is uh, paid for in a commodity. So if you were to sell a product for, sell the McNugget for 90 cents instead of a dollar, let's say but you knew that you could get a dollar for it, your, um, effectively in that moment, your profit was 20 cents, assuming you paid 70 cents, not just for labor, but for everything else that went into that McNugget for the raw materials and everything else. You paid 70 cents on top of which you made uh, 20 cents, so you sold it for 90. Now that means that your profit is going to be um, 20 cents, and your profit rate is going to be 20 over 70. It's gonna be the amount uh, proportionate to what you paid for in cost. Now this is different from surplus value. In order to calculate surplus value, you need to look at that excess above the cost of what it took to make the thing, in this case, 20 cents. You need to compare that not to the total cost price of constant capital plus variable capital, but just the cost price of the variable capital. So let's say 30 cents was spent on labor, 40 cents on all the raw materials and everything else, and then you earn 20 cents. In order to figure out profit, like I said, the relationship is between 20 and 70, whereas for surplus value, it is between 20 and 30, because 30 is what was spent on wages, and we know that surplus value only comes out of wages. And so this would be a, a rate of 67% because 20 over 30 is 67%, you know, give or take. So this corresponds to a profit rate of 67, or sorry, a surplus value rate of 67%, whereas you have a profit rate of whatever 20 over 70 is, which is probably like around 30%. So if the capitalist wanted to earn more, they could make their workers work harder and make it so that instead of 90 cents, they could sell that object for, or if they wanted to extract more surplus value from the labor put into something, they could then sell it for a dollar instead of 90 cents. And this would mean that you would have 30 cents of extra money of what you're, what is sold for above the cost now compared to the 30 that was spent on labor, and you have a surplus value rate of 100%. Now this is how something like competition is made possible, because you can have differing rates of surplus value that are being extracted from workers, where you could have another, say the person who owns Burger King, only wants to make a surplus value rate of 50%. So they uh, sell for 15 cents above. So they are selling their McNuggets for 85 cents instead of a dollar or instead of 90 cents. And what they get then is that they are earning less in terms of surplus value, but they might be able to undercut their competitor and are then able to uh, sell more and make up for the cost in that way. Now, in order for the capitalist economy to actually run, nothing can just be sold for their cost price. All things have to be sold for excess of that cost price because it is the nature of capitalism to expand. You need to take some extra money that you earn to turn it into capital that you can then use 
to help you make even more capital in the future by investing in more machines, by investing in more labor, by investing in uh, knowledge that is going to make your labor more efficient and so on. And here he adds a little jab against uh, Proudhon, who is a socialist at the time and a vulgar economist, as he, as Marx classifies him, who tries to imagine a capitalist world in which things are just sold for their cost price, to which Marx says that that's total, that's ridiculous. Then it would cease to be capitalism, and it would just be a way to exploit workers even further, because you might sell a thing at its cost price, but that will only mean that the buyer who's going to be somebody already who has uh, disposable income, who's going to be able to buy this stuff, is then just going to use it to uh, earn more capital. Because they're going to be buying something for under its natural price in terms of what the average profit rate would be, and they can then go and make even more money. So Proudhon, according to Marx, is just living in this fantasy world. And that brings us to chapter two, titled The Rate of Profit. So the capitalist process of valorization goes as follows, where you have money, you take that money and you buy a commodity. Let's say I buy a house. So I have $100,000, I buy a house, whatever house is worth $100,000. And then in 10 years, I sell that house for $150,000. So I have transformed that house into $50,000 more money. Or better yet, let's say no time has passed, I just buy a house and I sell it for more than it's worth. What I have done is effectively valorized my money. I have made my $100,000 that I started with into $150,000 as though by magic. And this is what is meant by valorization. Now the capitalist doesn't care how they valorize their money, how they valorize whatever they own, they just want it to happen. They don't care. They don't want to figure out if it's coming from the means of production, which it wouldn't be, but they don't want to even think about this, or the materials or from labor. They don't care. They just want to earn more, which is one of the ways, and this is really one of the guiding threads behind all of the volumes of capital that Marx is demonstrating, is that capitalists are notoriously bad at capitalism in that they do not understand the ways that it works what will work against capitalism, like automation, for example, and ways that people can actually earn more money, which is really the irony to all of this, the way that Marx demonstrates a knowledge of capitalism that far exceeds Adam Smith and David Ricardo and even people today. Now, it serves their interest, that is the capitalist interest, not to understand the differing ways that uh, constant capital machines, uh, raw materials, versus wages and variable capital, the differing ways that these products or these uh, means of production enter value into commodities. They don't care, as I think I've made clear enough. They just, as long as there's more money at the end, doesn't matter. Now, what this has done is it hides the fact that at the core of capitalist production is exploitation. And this is because the real source of value comes from labor. And labor, in order to confront this fact, would demand that people also confront the fact that labor as a commodity is being underbought. It must be bought for less than it is actually worth or else the capitalists would not make money. And capitalism normalizes this exploitation. It wants to naturalize this exploitation. Now, additionally, economists, by ignoring this, they ignore the way that labor is the source of value. And really, this is Adam Smith acknowledges this as well, and David Ricardo. It's labor that creates value. Now, other economists, and this is also Adam Smith and David Ricardo, quickly forget that and say that value really emerges in circulation, where things are being exchanged. That's where prices are determined, and therefore that is where value is determined. And this is just a clever trick that is used in order to hide that fact that it comes from labor, that it comes from uh, surplus value. And here he offers us uh, a Kantian distinction. Now, I'm going to explain what I mean here, so don't be scared. He says that the price of a thing sold in exchange refers to the phenomenal aspect of a commodity, its phenomenal existence in exchange. Whereas the value that is given to it, 
that is the real source of its value is the noumenal side of the thing, of the commodity sold. So he takes this from Kant because Kant, in the critique of pure reason, makes a distinction between things that we can see and experience and touch and, and hear and feel. He makes a distinction between those things that are phenomenal, he just calls them phenomenal, versus what is actually there. And the reason that he makes this distinction is because different people will have different uh, relationships or different experiences of those things, which is why some people might like tomatoes and some people don't, or some people might like mushrooms and some people don't. We have different experiences with different things because, you know, we're all different people with different eyes and different ears and different mouths. And so by virtue of that, there's the thing that exists in itself, which is the noumenon, versus the thing that is experienced, that is the phenomenon. So in exchange, in the capitalist mode of exchange, there is a price value attached to things, and this is its phenomenal existence as value. But it's a real value, its original true value, the point at which value emerges, is the labor and production that goes into it, which is the noumenon. And he doesn't really elaborate much on this point, but anyways, I think it's a good point. And that puts us here into chapter three, titled The Relationship Between Rate of Profit and the Rate of Surplus Value. So as I already mentioned, if profit, that which exceeds above the cost of things, is related to the total cost, so constant plus variable capital, then you have profit rate. If you only relate that extra cost that you sell something for to the variable capital, that is your surplus value rate. So both profit and surplus value originate from labor, how labor is exploited in production. This means that profit is going to be determined by surplus value, the rate of exploitation, which means that profit has to be equal to or lower than the surplus value. It can't be higher. So he offers us an example here. He says, if you have an object sold for $100 and $80 of that was spent on machines, constant capital, 20 of it was spent on uh, wages, and then you had $20 of surplus value, you would then be able to turn that original $100 that you spent on constant capital and on wages into 120 because you've extracted $20 on top of everything there. This means that the surplus value rate is 100% because 100, uh, sorry, because 20 was spent on variable capital on wages and 20 was extracted above the total cost price. Now your profit rate is only going to be 20%, and that is because you have 20, which is above the cost price, is related to the rest, to the whole cost price, which is 100, because 80 plus 20, 80 spent on constant capital, 20 spent on wages, which means that you have a profit rate of 20%. And you can never have a situation in which the profit rate is higher than the surplus value rate. Now there are many different factors that can affect the rates of profit and the rates of surplus value. So for example, let's say that surplus value is uh, constant. And additionally, the original money put into it remains constant as well. What could happen then, there are different, many different things that could happen, but you could come out with the same end product if you raise the amount that you then spent on constant capital, which you know, you could very well do, which you could then compensate for by reducing, and this is where V changes, by bringing down or up what you spend on wages. So you could have $100 that is represented in $80 of constant capital and $20 of variable capital, or you could have that same $100, remember that stays the same, which is then equal to $90 in constant capital versus $10 in variable capital. Or we could have a situation in which the big C, what is spent on, uh, on the whole thing, actually changes. So we could get a situation in which uh, surplus value is constant and amount spent on wages changes, but also the amount that the total amount that is spent changes as well. So for example, if the surplus value, that is the rate of exploitation, 
the actual amount earned in terms of surplus value, so not the rate at which it happens, the actual amount earned will rise or decrease in proportion to a rise or, in de or decrease in what is spent on variable capital. So variable capital goes up, then ver uh, surplus value would need to go up, which would mean that the rate, uh, the surplus value rate, rate of exploitation would remain consistent. So if variable capital went from $10 to $20, that would mean that the rate of sur the surplus value would have to go to 10 from 10 to 20 as well, so that the same rate of 100% could be maintained. Now, what's important to note about this is that if the rate of surplus value, like in this case, remains 100%, so we go from 10 to 20 to 30, and according, accordingly, the surplus value goes from 10, 20 to 30 as well to maintain uh, the same congruence with the variable capital. What would happen here to profit is that profit will actually go up as well, assuming that the amount spent on constant capital remains the same, because the total cost price will, will go up, but the total uh, amount that is earned will also go up at a rate greater because the amount spent on constant capital is not changing. Or we could have a situation in which uh, VNS, uh, variable capital plus uh, surplus value remain constant and the amount spent and the amount spent on uh, constant capital changes. And we could see an increase here uh, or a reduction in the profit rate because the amount of exploitation that creates profit because profit comes from surplus value stays down while total cost price goes up in the term in terms of what is spent on machines and raw materials now anyways they go on and on about this thinking about what happens if the surplus value rate remains constant in this case we were thinking about it as 100 percent. now what if the surplus value rate changes where we get differences in the rate of surplus value well if there's a change in uh, surplus value rate there's going to be a change in the profit rate where if the rate of surplus value goes up, the profit rate will go up. And different things can affect this. So the length of the working day for workers can make it so that there's more surplus value earned, which means more profit earned. Or workers are made to work even harder in the same amount of time. So surplus value goes up, profit goes up. Or maybe they'll slash uh, the actual price of labor. They'll reduce wages, which means that surplus value rate of surplus value goes up, and so therefore does profit rate go up. Now I think you get the idea here. He goes into many different examples, uh, presenting many different examples, but I, I think you get the idea. The big point though is that depending on the ratios between C, V, and S, the, there will be a rate of change in terms of surplus value or profit rate. So there might be situations in which the surplus rate goes up, but profit rate comes down. And this could happen in a situation in which more is actually being spent on constant capital in a, like a great sum, like a capitalist wants to throw a ton of money to buy all this new equipment, but also they're extracting more from workers. But the amount that they're extracting from workers, although the surplus value rate goes up, that is the level of exploitation goes up, it does not go up at a greater pace than what is spent on constant capital. So this will mean that the ratio between surplus value and variable capital, the rate of exploitation will go up as people are made to work harder, but the profit rate will go down because the surplus value rate will actually have a lower relationship with the total cost price because of all the new money that is spent on uh, all this new machinery or equipment. And that puts us here into chapter four, the effect of the turnover on the rate of profit. And this, this whole chapter was written by Engels, so just so you know that. So we need to do a little brief recap of volume two for those that don't remember. So as soon as we consider turnover, we have to acknowledge idle or unproductive capital. So if I have a business, I make chairs, I go to the store with a chair and I say, hey, uh, buy this chair that chair might sit on the shelf for five years before it is sold. And somebody's going to need to be paying for that chair to be there because somebody's going to need to be paying for the storage of that chair. Someone's gonna be needing to pay for lighting that will light up the place that the chair is being sold. We'll need to maybe pay labor to constantly dust the chair and so on. So in these moments, what we are confronted with is idle 
uh, production. That is, we have just really un unproduction. We really have something that we've produced that isn't earning money, but it's just costing money. And this is one element of turnover time that capitalists are trying to minimize. So between the time they start production and the time they sell, they want, they want to shorten that as much as humanly possible. They don't want their stuff sitting on the shelves for five years, not being sold, because then they aren't earning the money on that. So this whole turnover period is comprised of two large parts. There's the production part and the circulation part. So the capitalist wants to reduce production time by having more effective machines, more effective labor, more efficient labor, more efficient machines. And they want to reduce the circulation time, how much time that thing is spending, that object is spending sitting on the shelves, by having better transport, quicker transport, having better communication, better sales tactics, and so on. So if we consider a whole turnover period between the time that money is spent and that money is earned back in the sale of the product plus that extra on top, so this is the process of valorization, of turning money into more money, what we have here is the general formula. And the general formula goes like this, that the mass of surplus value appropriated in the course of a year is therefore equal to the mass of surplus value appropriated in one turnover period, so from the period, the point that an object is starting to be produced to the time that it is sold, now multiplied by the number of such turnovers in a year. This is how we figure out the rate of surplus value in, in an industry in a year. As for the profit rate, however, we can attain this by multiplying the percent of surplus value extracted by the number of turnovers and variable capital all divided by the total capital. So in mathematical terms, the profit rate is equal to the surplus value rate times the number of turnovers times the, uh, the relationship of variable capital to constant capital in that arrangement. Or in other words, because mathematical formulas are difficult to convey through words sometimes, Profit rate is equal to the surplus rate, surplus value rate, times the number of turnovers, times the amount spent on variable capital, all divided by total price of cost, or total capital. Now, it's often hard to actually find out these numbers in industry, in the economy, to find out the actual rate of profit, because capitalists don't keep super... Uh, accurate, at least at the time, I don't know if this has really changed, but they don't keep super accurate records that actually breaks down the amount that's spent on constant capital versus real living labor. Because why would they? They don't see a difference, right? They just see them, them both as being a means to attain more money, which is all that matters. And so it's hard to know just how much profit is earned above what is spent on wages which would determine the rate of surplus value, the rate of exploitation. But in any case, we move here into chapter five, which is back to Marx now, titled Economy in the Use of Constant Capital. So if the rate of surplus value increases through an increase of the working day or an intensity of work, what we would find is that the relationship between constant capital to total capital what is spent on machines versus what is spent totally in cost price with machines and with and plus raw materials with uh, labor costs, will this relationship will grow apart. So the relationship of constant capital to total capital will grow farther apart as the rate of surplus value increases by lengthening the working day or making it more intense. Now it's important to have a grasp of what is actually spent in each, in each part of industry in order to have an understanding about this rate of exploitation that comes about through surplus value. And this is really only possible when we live in a, in a situation, when a situation exists in which there are uh, masses of people working with machines as they are being exploited. And this establishes what Marx calls a socially combined worker. And if you remember from volume one, he added the qualification that the cost of an item is not going to just be determined by the amount of labor that goes into it. He says that it's actually going to be determined by the socially necessary labor that goes into it. The relationship between laborers across different industries in order to find the equilibrium point 
what should be the average cost of a thing according to the amount of labor that should go into it. So here he's kind of returning to that idea to give us this idea of the socially combined worker who works with the means of production generally as a, as a kind of homogenous mass. So totally different situations might arise. As time goes on, the cost of labor might go up or it might go down. And at the same time, the price of machines, the means of production of, of, uh, of raw materials might go up or they might go down. But in any case, any change or fluctuation primarily benefits the capitalist. So if the means of production, the cost of the means of production in machines goes down, it only benefits the capitalist and not the worker because the worker only views the means of production as a tool for the benefit of the capitalist. And it is the role of capitalism or one of its roles to hide this fact that people are exploited in their labor and that the things that they are earning, while it might afford them more than they had before, is always going to come at the expense of their being exploited, of their earning less than what they are actually earning the capitalist. And of course, there are long histories of capitalists actively avoiding and resisting the uh, imposition, the implementation of uh, safety measures in workplaces. So the amount of people who get hurt on the job is just innumerable. Um, and you always have efforts to try to reduce wages by capitalists. And the only reason today, at least in North America, we have things like a weekend or not 16 hour days of work is because people have said, no, we are not going to work for this much time. If it were up to the capitalists, or if we just got rid of the minimum wage, for example, capitalists would be totally happy with paying people a dollar, two dollars uh, an hour just to get them to work. Now, in addition to the exploitation and suffering that capitalists impose upon workers, they also participate in really egregious waste. So with, with the improvement of machines, we actually see the possibility to reduce waste where machines grow more efficient, but at the same time, they aren't going to do this unless it's earning them more money and they can produce more crap that will then be, uh, will end up in landfills, will end up not being properly used. Or you get situations in which car manufacturers will just destroy their own stock in order to elevate, artificially elevate the price of the remaining stock. Now, when we think about social labor, the entire mass of workers that work together in their alienation, he offers us at the end of the chapter here another distinction between what he calls universal labor and communal labor. And he says that universal labor refers to the entire history of labor, be it in production or science, you know, in knowledge or whatever, that has kind of pushed history to this point where people using machines are using machines that have been brought to them by labor, what Marx calls dead labor that exists in like a machine in a factory that was made by labor that, you know, the, the workers aren't there anymore, but the products of their labor are there. Or the knowledges that have been, that have been accrued in order to know how to make the right buildings, make the right machines. This is the universal labor that we are all a part of and that we all reap the benefits of versus communal labor that is the here and now living labor that is being exploited. And of course, the history uh, of universal labor is that it too is exploited, be it in through slavery, serfdom, uh, you know, feudalism, and so on. And that puts us here into chapter six, the effects of changes in price. So here he considers what effect a change in the price of raw materials or machinery has on profit. So on constant capital, simply as prices go up, profit is going to come down or vice versa. If uh, prices go down, then profit is going to go up. Now, as he says this, he's, he's bracketing off competition because in the real world, things are a little different. There isn't like a one-to-one -one relationship in the change of profit rate and the change of the cost of raw materials and constant capital. And the reason for that. Uh, is because that we tend to see a rise, or what we tend to see is that there, if there's a rise in profits from produced goods, to a greater extent, that will change to a greater extent than the cheapness of the raw materials that has gone down in price. Or if there is a rise in the price of raw materials, there isn't going to be a concomitant exact inverse proportion 
in the way that profit rate goes down. It might go down in the real world much more than the raw materials actually went up in price. Now, if we think about production in terms of the three costs, that is cost of machines as constant capital, cost of raw materials, which is still part of constant capital, but like fluid constant capital, and then cost of wages. Let's think about these three different costs. What he shows us in Capital Volume 2 is that the value of a machine is given over to the product that it makes gradually in accordance with the deterioration of that machine. Now, the value of raw materials is going to give itself over entirely as those raw materials are depleted into the produced thing. And then labor is what is able to give value and create extra value that comes out in the, in the form of exploitation that is taken on top of what is paid in wages. Now, what happens here is that if machines or, and let's say machines and labor grow more efficient, what will happen is that the value of what they make will actually go down. So if you are suddenly able to make a thousand loaves of bread for the same amount of cost, same amount of value in labor and in constant capital as you were able to do before, like in machines, not raw materials, we're going to bracket that off for now. If you are able to do that, to just increase tenfold the number of products that you can make, what this will mean is that the same value is now distributed over 10 times the number of products, which means that therefore you're going to have much less value imparted into each of those products. Now, this doesn't really happen with raw materials. So the example he gives is like, um, there isn't going to be a change in what flour can add in terms of value to make bread. Like, you're always going to need the same amount of flour to make bread. There would, there would have to be a pretty big radical change or like a scientific discovery to really change that. But like, you're always going to need the same length of shoelace to tie a shoe. Uh, you know, st assuming like generally standard styles of shoes. So the idea here is that these differing costs, constant versus raw materials versus variable capital, as they change in uh, kind of efficiency, they're going to have different effects on the end product where it's harder to make raw materials more efficient. These are just the kind of... Um, products that the means of production and labor uses in order to make that end thing. Now with production comes the very possibility, and this is kind of a side point, but it comes with the very possibility of overproduction, and this will produce crises. As you get overproduction, you're going to see a decline in demand, and you're going to have people have spent a bunch of money in producing things that they aren't going to be able to sell, and you're going to get a crisis. And capitalists don't see this until it's happened. They don't, they don't feel the effects of it until it, it's too late. And at which point it's too late and they can't go back. They can't undo the production of the things. So he goes on to provide some examples of crises in raw materials production, the production of raw materials. Specifically, he presents the uh, overview of cotton industry between 1845 and 1860. Now, I'm not going to go into all the historical details that he presents. The big point is that cotton was booming. There was a lot of cotton who was selling good price, you know, a lot of production of it, and so many more uh, factories and mills were opened as a result. Now, this caused scarcity of raw materials, essentially, because suddenly there was this huge boom of demand, and then there was no supply, and then all of those people that who were dependent on that supply couldn't actually buy any, and it was it essentially forced uh, stagnation. It forced all these mills to stop producing whatever they were using the cotton for. And so prices of everything went down, rent went down, uh, profit went down, wages went down, and it produced this crisis. And that puts us here into the last brief chapter I'll cover, uh, supplementary remarks to part one. And here he just provides a little recap. He says that the bourgeois do not regard profit as original, uh, that is from uh, surplus value, because they think it only in, uh, originates in circulation, so they don't see labor as being the original point here, and they see the rate of surplus value might be the same 
in two businesses. Like they might th- see the same rate of exploitation across two businesses, but other factors, for example, the market, um, you know, sales tactics and so on might affect the profit. So they say, see that and say, oh, look, value doesn't actually originate from labor. It comes from circulation. It comes from cleverness in sales or whatever, which is all just a way to hide the fact that labor is really the source of value. And that puts us here into part two, the transformation of profit into average profit. And that will close up this episode. So uh, I hope you like what I did. Um, If you did like what I did, you could leave a like, a share, tell your friends. It would really help me out because there's I couldn't put together the number of hours that this has taken me. But in any case, if you like what I did, do all those things. If there's anything I excluded, I'd love to hear about it. Anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. And uh, yeah, catch you next time. Take care.